Okay, so today we're going to talk about deep homology, and we're going to wrap up some of our last comments about phylogenetics, and we're also going to talk really briefly about this week's readings from your inner fish. So before we do that, just some uh, some course logistics, as I'm sure you well know, um, class was canceled today, so exam two is now going to be in class on Friday instead of on Wednesday, and the SymBio assignment is due on Wednesday now, today. But again, if you want to turn that in earlier electronically, feel free to send it to us and or. So uh, I left off last time having given you guys an example um, of phylogenetic tree construction using hobbits, ogres, humans, goblins, elves, trolls, dwarves, and giants. And um, with these 10 traits. So I'll spend just a little bit of time walking you through the example, but I drew out the tree as the answer here if you want to compare notes. Um, the outgroup here, you can see, has no derived character state, so all the things that aren't X's you know are the things that are um, ancestral, and all the things that are X's are derived. So for example, Ogres, trolls, and giants share large bodies that they don't share with the, the outgroup, nor do they share that with any of the other organisms. So they probably have an, uh, an ancestor that they don't share with any of the other organisms on the list, and so on and so forth for all of these different traits. So looking at the most uh, commonly shared synapomorphies, we can start looking at um, some some distant, most recent common ancestors. So, um, hobbits, humans, goblins, elves, and dwarves are all gregarious. They live in cities. So perhaps the common ancestor among all of them was gregarious and lived in cities, and it's a derived character state in just the lineages that the lineage that led to those lineages. So on and so on. If I were to be tried to identify one trait that sort of didn't agree or tell the same story or nest within the other synapomorphies, it would be live underground, which seems to place dwarves, goblins, and hobbits together in a way that doesn't necessarily agree with hair on their feet or ability to forge magical items or long live, right? So they seem to share a more recent common ancestor with elves based on this, and humans, goblins, and hobbits seem to be grouped together based on this instead of hobbits, goblins, and dwarves based on this. So these are probably the interesting traits to be looking at. We may have to construct two trees to compare. When we do that, we get one tree um, that invokes fewer evolutionary changes over time. And this is that tree. So you can see based on this tree, uh, ogres, giants, and trolls should share trait one and three. Trolls and ogres share trait two. All of these organisms share trait five. Um, and then two traits split, separate elves and dwarves from the rest. Another trait that's an autapomorphy for dwarves. Six and seven separate goblins, humans, and hobbits from the others. And then four and ten separate goblins and humans from the others. Humans lost six. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve uh, evolutionary changes that you in this tree. And that should be the most parsimonious. If you found another tree that invokes 12 changes and it's legitimate, um, it's probably because these questions are really tough to design. I hope that's not the case. If it's the case, then I've probably made a mistake. Um, but this is the answer I got. So hopefully it agrees with yours. And if it doesn't, uh, and you think you're still right, please let me know. 
Okay, some last closing comments that I want to make about phylogenetic trees. Well, we've seen now scenarios where different traits, different characters tell different evolutionary stories, right? We just saw one where if we looked at lives underground, it would look like dwarves were more closely related to, to goblins and hobbits than humans were. Um, but if you look at other traits, that seems to disagree. So they're telling different evolutionary stories. So in our case, it was because there were homoplasies, right? So there were independent gains of particular traits or losses in particular branches. Um, it turns out in real life, this isn't even the only sort of phenomenon that can um, result in different traits or different genes telling different evolutionary stories. We also have to worry about genetic exchange, right? So it could be that that isolated lineages, lineages that are considered different species, aren't as isolated as you might think, even though they still get considered uh, different species. They could still be exchanging genetic information. So you see examples uh, all the time in, in, um, in bacteria and viruses where there are events where genes get traded across different species of bacteria, right? So unfortunately, right, the bacteria can acquire even antibiotic resistance genes um, from lysed bacteria in their environment. So um, they can get new genetic information from completely different lineages. And you can imagine that how much of a nightmare that would be in terms of constructing phylogenetic trees based on those genes. Okay, in other more complex taxa, you see the same thing, uh, only it gets a different word. It gets introgressive hybridization. So um, we'll talk about an example of, of what introgressive hybridization is in just a second. Um, but it's, you know, it's the same idea. There's also um, what's called incomplete lineage sorting. And we'll see an example of this in a second. But these are all different ways that um, different phenomena that can result in different um, genes or different traits telling different evolutionary stories. So let's look at the genetic uh, integrative hybridization first. So what do I mean by this? Um, very briefly in another talk, we talked about this dark fur allele um, that was derived in domesticated dogs and then found its way back into uh, wolf populations. So this, this, this coat allele wasn't derived in any wolf lineages, but by mating with dogs, some wolf lineages ended up getting that allele back into their population's gene pool. Okay, so that, that the over evolutionary time, just that allele <laughs> was favored enough to continue continue being uh, occurring at high frequencies in that population. So it, other dog alleles may not have also successfully introgressed into that population. It could have just been that one allele at that one gene, so that one dark fur color allele. So. This this brings to light, you know, these the genomes of these wolves, of these black wolves, is no less wolf-like at the other genes, but it's going to look more dog-like at this coat color gene because it has a dog-like allele that's occurring at high frequencies in the population. So if you use that coat color gene to make a phylogenetic tree, that population is going to look like it's in the middle of a dog um, clade, a dog uh, monophyly. Whereas if you use other genes, um, other loci to make the tree, it's going to fall well within a wolf clade and not a dog clade. So hopefully that makes sense. So um, because of introgressive hybridization, because hybridization led dog like alleles to you know, sort of bleed back into the wolf population. Um, that gene would tell a different evolutionary story than the other genes at the wolf level. Okay, incomplete lineage sorting is a little bit complicated, and I don't want you to worry too much about uh, about the details. But the idea here is that maybe at some point 
um, in the history of the lineage that led to, say, humans, chimps, and gorillas, there was an ancestral polymorphism, right? So this could be different genes or it could be different alleles of the same gene. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the idea here is that the ancestor or the ancestral population had some variation here. And for whatever reasons, certain lineages lost those alleles or those genes, but it did it in such a way that the pattern of that loss doesn't resemble the pattern of the actual true evolutionary lineage of those organisms. So here we see an example where um, the ancestor, let's say, has the, has the yellow allele, the red allele, and the blue allele. And over evolutionary time, the lineage that led to humans lost all of those alleles except for the yellow one. And the chimpanzees lost all of the alleles except for the blue one. And the gorillas lost all the alleles except for the red one. But we know we could make a phylogenetic tree of the alleles and discover that the red allele and the blue allele have a more recent common ancestor with each other than either does with the yellow one, which would suggest that chimpanzees and gorillas share a more recent common ancestor with each other than humans. But we know that that's not true. We know that humans and chimpanzees share a more recent common ancestor than either does with gorillas. Okay, so this particular allele, or this particular gene, or it could be these particular sets of genes, would tell a different evolutionary story than the actual true tree. Okay, so that's what incomplete lineage is. I'm never going to ask you to explain it, but hopefully the concept basically um, some ancestral polymorphism doesn't um, doesn't quite sort out the same way that the rest of the or the majority of the genes do. It doesn't sort in the same way that the actual true evolutionary history. <clears throat> okay, so just to go back here. Different traits or different genes, different characters can tell different evolutionary stories because homoplasies are losses and branches because of genetic exchange or because of Okay. Now to dive into the Shubin paper um, that was assigned reading for, for class. Um, so it introduces this concept, which we've touched on really, really briefly before, of deep homology. And the idea behind deep homology is that there are um, maybe genetic re regulatory apparati, apparatuses, <laughs> apparatus, maybe it's omniplural, um, that gets used to build morphologically and phylogenetically disparate organismal features. So things that look at the surface morphologically, or even when we construct phylogenetic trees, they look like they would be different, but they in fact share, cryptically sometimes, share this underlying genetic regulatory apparatus. Um, so uh, let's use an example to sort of get at what we mean. So we have this ancestral animal photoreceptor, and it gives rise to two different types, two distinct types of photoreceptors, rhabdomeric photoreceptors and ciliary photoreceptors. And in different organisms, you see those two photoreceptors, either one or the other, gets used as the main uh, as the main photoreceptor for light detection. So for example, in vertebrates, it's the ciliary photoreceptor um, that gets used for light detection. And in invertebrates, um, the rhabdomeric photoreceptor gets used. So these completely distinct photoreceptors seem to have these totally in, uh, independent lineages, right? So this eye is essentially getting derived in a completely novel way from the, the vertebrate eye. However, if you go back <laughs> and look, you see some, some uh, species that are uh, ancestral, some extant species that descend from an ancestor common to vertebrates and invertebrates, these polychaete worms, 
actually have both types of photoreceptors used for light sensing in the same organism. So one gets used for, for light detection in the eyes, and one gets used for light detection sort of in the <clears throat> So further evidence that these are that this there are a lot of regulatory genes that regulate eye development in different Organisms that have completely different types of eyes comes from the looking at these genes, in particular eyeless and Pax six, which we know researchers have discovered. Um, it's crucial for Drosophila eye development and is crucial for vertebrate eye function. So these genes have homologs in invertebrate Drosophila melanogaster, fruit fly, and invertebrate uh, and vertebrate. And I've already mentioned this one, the common ancestor of bilaterian vertebrates and invertebrates likely had both photoreceptor types. Different types get used for light detection in different lineages. The answer is to have both. And finally, it's not just the light sensing tissue that, um, that seems to have this cryptic homology, uh, but even the neurons involved in processing the visual, sig visual signals get specified by the same exact transcription factors. So the transcription factors that tell those cells to be interneurons involved in visual signal processing are the same transcription factors in Drosophila and in vertebrates. So that's kind of cool. Right, so even these traits that historically get touted as these analogs that are not homologs. Right, eyes in invert, eyes in squid, and eyes in humans are totally different, um, and they don't share a common ancestor. But a lot of the genes involved in eye formation end up actually sharing common ancestors. So they are cryptically or or deeply homologous. Another example is in these beetles. So there are a couple of different families of beetles where um, typically it's the males have these really exaggerated and beautiful horns that they use um, for uh, as weapons essentially to battle other males, other conspecific males, um, for, uh, for females essentially. And the horns lack obvious homology to other, other appendages, right? So a lot of these lineages of beetles, a lot of these species that have horns, are nested within a phylogeny, a clade, that don't have horns, right? So it looks like it's, a, it's an autapomorphy in this particular species, but you see that same autapomorphy, that same apomorphy, being derived several times in different, um, different species. Okay, so there's many examples of, quote, independently derived horned lineages, but you see it being quote, independently arrived, derived so many times that it sort of makes you wonder, well, just how independently are these, how independent are these derivations? If it seems so easy for these horns to evolve repeatedly, maybe there's some underlying something that's making it easy for these kind of things to evolve over and over again. And that's sort of the point here, is that they've demonstrated in at least one genus of dung beetles that the horns express a suite of genes that's typical of other insect limb expression patterns. So if you look at the limb uh, of, of these, if you look at the gene expression of a few of these different genes in, in typical limbs, right, limbs that are shared among many different uh, beetles and in fact many different insects, you've seen this similar expression of genes. And it turns out that many of those genes are in a sense hijacked for the same kind of expression in these novel appendages of these horns. Okay, so you see very similar uh, suites of genes being turned on in, in sort of very similar locations. So that's kind of cool. So that's another example of a deeply homologous trait. Um, a third example that they talk about in the paper has to do um, with uh, fish and, and tetrapod limbs, which we talked about several times which is why I didn't want to bring it up yet again. So that's the concept of deep homology. Let's move on to talk about the reading from your inner fish. So 
the first chapter that you guys were responsible for last week was about uh, bodies and body plans. And it sort of raises this really interesting question about, well, just how exactly is a body different from a group or, or a colony of cells, right? If, if you have a yeast cell and it replicates over and over again, so you have this little pile, this colony of yeast cells, well, what makes that different from a body? Can you call that a body? Well, it turns out that no, you can't. Um, in order for something to be a body, instead of just a colony of cells, there has to be some sort of division of labor, this concept of division of labor among the cells. So if you took a couple of cells away from this yeast colony, the colony would be fine, right? Every cell in that colony is, is its own individual. Um, and it doesn't depend on processes, metabolic processes, say, that other cells can do that it can't. Okay, So removing a certain group of those cells isn't going to kill all of the cells. But if you do that to a body, right? if you remove all of our heart cells, you're going to kill the whole organism, even the cells that aren't heart cells. So there's this division of labor where cells are doing different things for the body. Okay. In order to form a body, cells also need to be able to stick together, and they need to be able to communicate with one another. So a lot of the ways that, the, that organisms have evolved to do this um, is it's shared, is, is a homology among a lot of different eukaryotic lineages. So over time, this ability to stick together and communicate intracellularly um, intercellularly, I'm sorry. Uh, the next, the next thing that happens, I guess, in evolutionary time is these bodies become a little bit more complex. They become body plans with different body parts, and more molecules have to be involved um, that it, that uh, that give a body a structure. Okay, and a lot of these molecules are things like collagen and proteoglycans that that form cartilage and bone and teeth, all of those other sort of more rigid structures that you see in a lot of organisms. Okay, so that's in a nutshell how bodies are different from just a group of cells. <clears throat> Let's talk about sort of the ultimate evolutionary explanation for why a body would evolve. Right, so we saw over our evolutionary history in the, in the world, in the fossil record, you see just billions of years where organisms stay single-celled, right? So uh, single cellular organisms sort of dominated the, the world's lifescape for billions of years. And then all of a sudden, in the... Um, Cambrian, you see this explosion in the fossil record of different body plans. So the idea there was that sticking together, cells that ended up grouping together to become bodies um, were, were much better at not getting eaten by, by other organisms. Um, right, and really, they've done experiments where they've demonstrated that this is... This is uh, um, not only an easily derived trait, but it also confers fitness. Um, so they took single cell, single cell organisms, put them in the presence of a predator that could eat them, and over the course of several generations, those cells that could stick together in clumps were better at not getting eaten by the predator and, and persisted. Even when they removed the predator then from the experiment and allowed generations to, to, to pass, that, that trait actually didn't get lost. Right, so there seemed to be this optimal number of cells in a clump um, because they were algae cells and they needed to be able to photosynthesize. So I think, I think the optimal number was eight uh, cells clumping together. Um, and that eight clump stayed even after the selection pressure from the predator was removed from the system, which is kind of an interesting question in and of itself. But the point here is that um, getting a body is a really good way of not getting eaten. And another, um, another comment 
to make here is that a lot of the molecules that were necessary for single-celled organisms um, to become, to uh, or for uh, for multicellular organisms to to be a thing, right? In order to stick together and have all these body plans, um, a lot of those molecules are found in single-celled organisms. So one example of this is there are these um, single-celled organisms called cholinoflagellates and they make collagen. And that lineage seems to be a sister, uh, a sister clade, a sister group to multicellular organisms. Okay, this all raises a really interesting question of, well, if body plans are so great and there's a lot of reasons why organisms would need them, why didn't they evolve sooner? And wouldn't this only explain why it would be good to have a body after something else has a body big enough to eat you? All good questions. So why didn't it evolve sooner? Well, one hypothesis put forth in the book, and I would love to do more research on this at some point, was that um, bodies and body plans and the molecules involved in the making of those bodies and body plans um, are expensive energetically. They, they take a lot of energy. It, it costs a lot for a body to make collagen, for a body to move and to eat other multicellular organisms. And a lot of those molecules require a lot of oxygen. Okay? And oxygen wasn't really environmentally available until about a billion years ago, which is right around when you see the explosion of body plants. The next chapter has to do with olfaction. Um, so there, it was a cool chapter. I really enjoyed the chapter. Um, but just some little, uh, some quick bullet points about the chapter. So there are a whole lot of genes having to do with olfaction, and they're all very specific with the particular kind of scent molecule that they bind. Right. So all these all these genes are receptors, and they bind molecules and then send signals when those molecules bind to neurons. So if you look at these genes, these, these olfaction genes, in humans, you find that they are homologous to uh, olfaction genes in fish. And that some basal fish lineages, like lampreys and hagfish, have receptors that look ancestral to both air and water receptors. So in ray-thin fishes, in some of the more complex fish uh, lineages, you see the receptors are sort of optimized for smelling in water, whereas in a lot of terrestrial Tetrapod lineages, you see receptors that are sort of optimized for air, and those receptors are different, although they share a common ancestor. But in some of those early fish lineages, right, or extant descendants of those early fish lineages, you see receptors that look like both. <clears throat> so, in addition to that, in mammals in particular, there was a huge proliferation of genes involved in olfaction. So we have a lot more of these receptor genes as a group, right, as mammals, than most other groups of organisms. So smell was kind of an important thing for, for mammals and is kind of an important thing for most mammals. Um, so the idea here is that there was probably some kind of uh, massive duplication event early on in the mammalian evolutionary history that led to the duplication of these genes. And the duplicates were then, of course, sort of free to evolve new functions. So humans, for instance, have about a thousand olfactory genes. But interestingly for humans, 300 of those are completely non-functional. So let's take a look at that. This is just a figure, don't worry about too many of the details, that, that uh, clustered together a bunch of genes. So everything that's sticking out of these main lines are different genes that are involved in human olfaction. And every single one of them with a star is non-functional, right? So you see stars everywhere. So there are tons and tons of olfaction genes in humans that are non-functional. And you see something really similar in other lineages of primates that gained a new type of color vision. So particular lineage of primates that became visual predators and, and uh, um, either of fruits or of, of, of other animals started relying more on vision 
and the need for some of these, these genes relaxed. So selection to maintain those genes also relaxed. Cetaceans, right? So the lineage that um, includes dolphins and whales, they have exactly zero functional copies of their olfactory genes. Uh, and that is because they do not use uh, their nasal passages for smelling at all. Okay, so those genes, again, selection on, to maintain those genes for their original function is relaxed, so they just don't have any functional copies. But the point is, even if you look at humans or cetaceans and you sequence their genomes, you see all of these genes, even if they're non-functional, you see a vestige of them right, in, in our DNA, uh, a vestige of our evolutionary past, our relationship with other mammals and even with fish. Okay, the last two chapters are eyes and ears. Um, start with eyes. Just a couple of quick points I want to make about this. So there are a lot of genes. We've already seen this example talking about deep homology just a couple of slides ago. Uh, but there are a lot of genes that are deeply homologous among animal lineages that are associated with vision. So for an, as another example, if you take a mouse PAC6 gene, which is involved in eye formation, it can functionally replace the Drosophila melanogaster eyeless gene. So that's the name of the gene, eyeless. So PAC6 and eyeless are homologs, they're orthologs. One's found in mice, one's found in Drosophila melanogaster. And if you replace eyeless with PAC6, you still get Drosophila melanogaster eyes. And if you express either one of those genes, PAC6 or eyeless, in other locations on a fly body besides where their eyes should be, it initiates eye formation in those new locations. And in some cases, those eyes are at least partially, function partially functional in those new locations. So you can put an eye on an antenna or on an abdomen or on a leg just by expressing um, eyeless or PAC6. So again, there is a lot of homology in the genes that are involved in eye formation and vision as distant as distantly back as lineages that gave rise to invertebrates and vertebrates. So that's a pretty old common combination. Okay, ears. Well, we've also talked about this example a little bit in class already, where you see a homology of mammalian ear bones and reptilian jaw bones. And this actually got noticed before decades before Darwin even published any of his theories. So this had been known for a while that these structures looked really similar. And, and just as an aside, sort of uh, in case you feel the need for an adaptive story here, um, having those extra two, uh, two bones, right? So reptiles and other, other tetrapods have just one bone in their ears, uh, whereas humans, I mean, uh, whereas mammals have three. Uh, and mammals can hear higher frequency sound because of these three bones. There's also another gene, it's called PAX2 this time, and it's necessary for uh, inner ear development in humans and mice. And they found a homolog in fish which have these organs called neuromass, which are not exactly, exactly functionally analogous to, to ears. But they found the PAX2 homolog in, in these other, other lineages. Incidentally, PAX2 and PAX6, which is involved in vision, also share a common ancestor. So here's just an illustration from the book of the different jaw bones. Um, in reptiles and what those bones sort of look like in, in ancient mammals and what they look like in an example of a modern mammal um, where they are tiny, tiny and are involved in supporting the ear. So those are the, the malleus and the incus. Um, the stapes have sort of a different evolutionary history. So that's all I wanted to talk about today in today's lecture. Uh, if you have questions, specific questions, about materials so far that's going to be on exam two, which includes this material, please feel free to email me. And if I think it's uh, an important enough question, I'll share 